from the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Thank you, Colonel West. Uh, I want to welcome all of our listeners uh, who are taking time out of their busy Independence Day to join us on this celebration of America's 240th, 240th birthday. And I am absolutely delighted to be sharing the microphone today with none other than the patriot of the Hoosier State, and that's J.D. Muneer. J.D., happy uh, happy 4th of July. Happy Independence Day to you, Kevin. Thanks so much. And uh, how's your 4th of July been working out for you so far? Oh, well, I'll tell you, we, we traveled from Indianapolis up to my hometown of Warsaw, here this morning, and I got a special person to, to say something just for a second or two. Uh, Warsaw is home to Ben Higgins, The Bachelor, on ABC's Bachelor program. And uh, we, we asked him what his thoughts, because he had his, his special fiance, and we uh, took some pictures and talked to him. Uh, he was the Grand Marshal of, of a Fourth July parade here in, in my uh, sister's uh, neck of the woods, where we're staying. And he said it's a day to remember freedom and liberty and family, the greatest day of the year. Well, I tell you, I think he must be a heck of a good bachelor. He's certainly a patriot. Yes, he is. And and I'll tell you what, uh, last week uh, Rick Trader made a lot to do because I kept calling Christina Honey. Well, Christina has something to say because she got her picture with the bachelor. <laughs> Hey, happy 4th of July, Kevin. Christina, happy Independence Day to you. Hey, thanks for being on the on the radio with us for a minute here. Yeah, we got an opportunity to speak with the bachelor of all people. Of course, he knew I was married with J.D. So the honey was totally married today, and he hugged me. And we asked him his comments about the 4th of July, what we thought was special. And he said it was the uh, not quoting him exact, but he said that it was all about freedom and the wonderful way to celebrate freedom and family right here in his hometown. So it was a kind of a special thing to do, except they had camera following him around everywhere instead of flags. <laughs> Well, th- th- there's a, a full quotient of American flags out uh, throughout my town, and and <clears throat> on much <clears throat> excuse me, that's a Independence Day frog in my throat, and as well as on much of the drive to to the uh, studio, and uh, the weather has been remarkably uh, mild and uh, uh, and enjoyable on this long weekend. I uh, went to an annual picnic that friends have had for decades to. To get together with long, long friends and longtime friends, and uh, eat far too much, and, and, and talk a little bit about our country and our families, and and you know just uh, a little table conversation about the uh, the upcoming election. Uh, we'll be talking much about that in the coming months, but uh, today, in fact, JD, uh, I'll forego uh, my, my my rather limited ability to put together a, a commentary. In favor of uh, of some timeless words, and, and I'll be reading uh, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, actually, starting in about another uh, two minutes. That's so excellent, Kevin. I I, I want to commend you. I, I did a little bit of reading at church yesterday on that, uh, and you know something real quick. I'll point out Thomas Jefferson as he penned the Declaration of Independence. You know he had he had an aversion, and there were some things they omitted. But he strongly railed, and he called him the Christian king, suspect, I think, uh, King George of Britain, uh, and he railed against slavery and and how the king uh, brought that about and how he was running that uh, in the colonies. Uh, they, they, they removed that from the final draft of the Declaration of Independence, but Jefferson was a staunch 
uh, abolitionist, and, and he railed. That was his first draft, if you will, uh, of the Declaration of Independence. And I was uh, doing some background reading myself recently, and uh, one of the other uh, brilliant minds, and there were many gathered at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia that July, but one of the other brilliant minds, John Adams, uh, is the one who approached Thomas Jefferson about uh, about putting these thoughts, these ideas, pen to paper. And Jefferson asked uh, John Adams, well, you're well regarded for your intellect. Why don't you write the document? And John Adams said, because everyone here hates me. <laughs> <laughs> his popularity polls were not as strong. It, it, as it wasn't because of his intellect. It wasn't because of his patriotism. He just had a way of annoying people. And Thomas Jefferson uh, was one of the uh, most soft spoken and perhaps uh, introverted people uh, in that assembly. <clears throat> he did not enjoy speaking in public. He apparently never enjoyed speaking in public. And his, uh, his greatest contributions, and, and they are, I mean, timeless, are in the form of his words put on parchment, ink on paper. And that's how we remember him today. Uh, uh, and, and so much a, a tremendous... Uh, patriot and 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 you know th- what Jefferson avowed and wh- how he defended the, our Constitution and our freedoms. I, I mean that is on. I mean Jefferson's target is on his back right now with this administration, and and it's such a good time today to remember Jefferson's words. And I know you're going to give us uh, that Declaration reading, and I'm looking forward to that. Well, uh, it, uh, it's a bit lengthy in comparison to my normal 500, 600-word uh, commentary. <clears throat> but on this day of all days every year, uh, I think it's important that uh, we read what he wrote and that convention blessed. And, in fact, what was read across the colonies as they assumed their new identity as states. And, in fact, what was read by the British king and the British parliament for a copy was sent there. So let me begin, J.D. Yes. In Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another... And to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient reasons. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object 
events as a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature a right inestimable to them and formidable formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time, after such dissolutions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and to eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for the quartering of large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. 
he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce to the necessity which denounces our separation and holds them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to, power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. J.D., that's the Declaration of Independence. One of them, that in our Constitution, are the most significant political documents the world's ever seen. It transformed, transformed this nation, and this nation transformed the world. The world was a different place before these words were put on paper And then these words were given real substance by the sacrifices of patriots. And uh, I believe that uh, Denise D'Souza, an immigrant himself, has said that America uh, is the indispensable nation in world history. Yes, and all men. You know what? I read this yesterday at church. You know what really got me what you read just about two minutes ago? He said, enemies in war 
but friends in peace. It took a Christian nation and Christian thinkers to, to pen that and, and to live that. And I, I think we, we need to get back to being a Christian nation again if we're going to survive. Well, I think we need to get back to admitting it. Um, I think we, we, we are a Christian nation. We're not a Christian government. This isn't a theocracy, but we are a Christian nation. It's been, uh, this country is, is, is framed and founded on values taught uh, in the Christian Bible. Uh, many of the signers, I believe over half of the signers of the Declaration and, 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 uh, and uh, members of the Constitutional Convention, 1788-1789, uh, were at some part in their lives members of the American Bible Society. For So for a, a historical revisionists to say that this country is not a Christian country is, is beyond confusion on their part. Kevin, this weekend uh, on Fox News, Katie McFarland, I think we've had her on our show, yeah. but she, she was a top national security advisor to Reagan and Bush, and she said we need to read this weekend, on the 4th of July especially, the Declaration of Independence. And she says when you read it, she goes, just substitute King George and, and the enumeration of all these horrible things he did and, and put in Washington, D.C. He goes, you're going to see that. Uh Think about the first sentence you read when he enumerated all those problems. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. We've seen that for seven and a half years. That's because human nature never changes. And, and the beauty in, in the Declaration and the beauty in our Constitution is it recognized human nature and understood it and, and, and framed it in its proper light. Uh, we are to trust the rule of law, not the rule of man. And, J.D., with that, uh, we're going into a break here on this 4th of July. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM. Our flagship station in Philadelphia and around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, AM, FM 24-7. They all end in .com. I'm Kevin Wade. J.D. Meneers with us. Happy 4th of July. You stay with us. We will be up with our first guest in just about uh, six and a half minutes. This is Rick Trader, host of the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. And I'm John Forsyth, owner of WNJC Radio. Fellow patriots, the Conservative Commandos Radio Show is for conservatives, about conservatives, and by conservatives. We are patriots who want to take our country back from the likes of Barack Obama, Harry Reid, George Soros, and Nancy Pelosi. But we can't keep up this fight without your critical support today. Can you help? Please go to www.helpccrs.com right now and make a donation by credit card or PayPal. That's www.helpccrs.com. Our goal is to expose the liberal agenda and distortions. We are fighting to spread the truth about political issues, political leaders, and conservative issues and values. Our hosts are not paid. In fact, we buy our own airtime studio time and pay our own expenses we created the show because we are trying to make a difference so can you help the ccrs expose the truth in 2014 and beyond go to www.helpccrs.com help keep the conservative commandos radio show on the air by going to www.helpccrs.com and make a donation today to return our country to the conservative roots created by our founding fathers. 9-11, it's a day that will go down in our history as the most horrific and destructive scene ever to happen on American soil. It will also be, for most Americans who witnessed it either up close or simply watched in horror on TV, America to participate in a national memorial I call the United Action of Prayer this coming 9-11 and every 9-11 from then on. 
United Action of Prayer is simply every American stopping whatever they are doing for one minute at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or pray in memory for the 9-11 victims and their families and perhaps a prayer of gratitude for living in a country where even 9-11 could not at all weaken the spirit of our great nation. If you're in a crash and have little cash, come to AJ Auto Body. We handle insurance claims fast and repairs are guaranteed to last at AJ Auto Body. Come check us out and without a doubt, you'll be satisfied. That's AJ Auto Body, 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. Family owned and operated for 30 years. We are a fully licensed and insured auto repair facility located at 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. We are your friend in the business. So stop in for a free estimate or call us at 856-251-0096. Check us out on the web at www.ajautobody.net. That's where you'll find our specials, discounts, and coupons. For all your car needs, come to AJ Auto Body, located at 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. 856-251-0096. What does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCSforAutomation.com. That's PCS, the number four, Automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio 1360 a.m. or around the world on the internet at wnjcradio.com check out our websites conservative commandos radio network.com and ccrn.com for rebroadcasts and network updates we are the conservative commandos radio network where even more newsmakers go to be heard from the east coast to the West Coast, and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Thank you, Colonel West. Uh, great friend of the show. Uh, we wish you a happy Independence Day as well. I'm Kevin Wade. Share and hosting duties with my good friend, the patriot of the Hoosier State, J.D. Manier. J.D.? Hey, great talking with you again, Kevin. It's been a great show. Well, it's a great day. It's our nation's birthday. 240 years ago today, this great experiment was started, and it's up to us to continue it. It never gets complete. It's an ongoing journey. Uh, 
And a person who is uh, who has served this country and served it well is our next guest. James Williamson, Colonel ret- retired colonel, was uh, has enjoyed a, a successful military career spanning over thirty years. A native of my home state of Delaware and a graduate of also my school, University of Delaware ROTC program. Uh, he was commissioned as a lieutenant in 1982. He served as a rifle platoon leader and exec officer. I uh, served in Germany uh, and then a company commander with the 82nd Airborne down in North Carolina. Uh, volunteered for the Special Forces. Graduated the uh, Special Forces Qualifications course in 1989. He's a combat veteran. Served the U.S. overseas, including Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and other places. He retired in 2012. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware and a uh, master's degree from uh, Georgia Washington University. Graduate of the Command and General Staff College, and he's now a member of the Special Forces Association and the Association for Intelligence Officers, the AFIO. And he is here to speak with us about the uh, recent uh, release of the report by the Select Committee on Benghazi and uh, what we should be seeing in that report and what it means to us. And with that, Colonel Williamson, welcome to the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. Uh, Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Happy Independence Day and uh, go Blue Hens. (laughs) <laughs> Go Blue Hens. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it, it's it's a Division II school, uh, but they have a, they put out a, a heck of a football team every year. And, and they do fill, I think, a 20,000 seats into that stadium. And uh, it's a testimony to, uh, to, the, uh, to the team and the long years of, uh, of fan support that uh, uh, that program has earned. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that you attended the, and graduated from the University of Delaware. And did you know you were going into, uh, you wanted to serve in the military before you went to college, or was that something of a, just some some expeditious decision uh, in your freshman year? No, it, it was a long-term goal uh, since I was a child. I, I was heavily influenced when the battle, Ballad of the Green Berets came out. Sure. In 1966, I guess, and uh, I kind of stuck with it. It uh, it was, it was a good thing looking back. And uh, you've held uh, uh, staff positions of increasing responsibility, uh, and, and, and now uh, you certainly have not uh, given up a love of country nor, uh, nor have turned away from your oath uh, in, in uh, retiring from the military. And you've taken a look at uh, the Select Committee on Benghazi and their final report. What should we have our eyes on there? Well, to, to sum it up, um, let's not look at this in terms of the political animal that it's become, which, which is hardly avoidable, being that we're in the middle of a campaign season, and it's also, I mean, one of the candidates for president is is one of the culpable parties. But it, intelligence should never have a political flavor to it. Um, which under this administration it has. Intelligence is what it is. It's the facts as they are. But I think to to sum it up, Kevin, uh, the Benghazi report demonstrates that there was a colossal failure at at all levels, uh, starting at the White House, the National Security Staff, Secretary Clinton's office, uh, certainly uh, Secretary Panetta and Department of Defense is to blame, and and uh, unfortunately, the CIA also failed. So I think we have an overall lack of will and a lack of foresight in responding to uh, or anticipating what all the intelligence said was almost imminent. And then uh, a lack of urgency and failure to respond while the events were going on. Was it willful blindness, Colonel Williamson? Absolutely it was. Um, you know, you have to you have to look at it within the framework of what was going on in Washington D.C. You know, we heard Mrs. Clinton talk about that 3 a.m. phone call. Well, that that phone call came at quarter of four in the afternoon, and she was asleep at the wheel. Uh, and if she wasn't, she just failed to act in in the time of national crisis. 
So it was willful disobedience or willful neglect. Uh, there's a lot of disconnect as far as who was actually running the government. Uh, if the president and secretary of defense directed that all efforts be saved, be made to save Americans, then why did nothing happen? Why were there no wheels up uh, until after the event was already over? There's, and is everybody okay with that? If I disobeyed the direct order of my commander, there, there'd be hell to pay. Now, now Colonel Williamson, when you... I, 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 Colonel Williamson, I want to pick up on that. If you disobeyed a direct order, now are you referring to uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta saying that he had issued a direct order uh, to the Pentagon to take all measures needed to uh, provide assistance? That's correct. But, but, um, but he was the highest civilian authority. They have to obey that order. And I would think, and you're a career military man, you can, you can certainly correct me, I would think that there are units, there are teams who are in fact eager to get that order in these circumstances. Is that true? That is true. And in fact, uh, they were ready. One of those teams was from my old unit, the the 10th Special Forces Group. Each theater commander, we used to call them SYNC, but uh, the the SYNC's in extremist force is one company of one battalion of a special forces group. That element happened to be on a training mission in Croatia at the time. They were ready to go. They responded within the DOD timelines. Unfortunately, there were no aircraft available. And then when the aircraft finally got there, the crews were beyond their their eight-hour crew rest period. So that was a failing uh, on, on behalf of Department of Defense. Failure to anticipate requirements. Failure to plan for contingencies, be it a broken aircraft or delays resulting in crew rest. When American lives, you know, I get the crew rest issue, but if American lives are at stake, you suck it up and you drive on, regardless of how much sleep you have. Sorry. Yeah, it it sounds like a a bureaucratic dodging. uh, And and no, no, I, I... I just can't accept that uh, that uh, an order was given and it could not be followed because of breakdowns in in, in the uh, in uh, the administrative organization. Uh, I, I believe that the the the, the uh, order was countermanded, and there's only one place that could, that could countermand that order. Right, and uh, which leads us to the question: was who was actually making decisions in the government, and and where was President Obama? He's the only one that can give cross-border authority to to actually penetrate the airspace of a foreign country. That can't be delegated. There were people in need. They were American citizens. They were under duress. They were under attack. They were being killed. And at that point, every American who has a, has a heart that beats and, and any sense of conscience has to be compelled to, to, to render assistance. And uh, our military organizations, uh, they are trained and, and geared up uh, for just such requests. And, and uh, what were there really flight crews that said they didn't have enough rest, and that's why they couldn't make the next six-hour flight? Is that acceptable? Which is nonsense. In, in the first case, on on the anniversary of nine eleven, which is a significant anniversary, not so much to us but to our our enemies, uh, the military should have anticipated that. Gee, this could have been a problem area. The White House had conference call, a teleconference the day prior to 9-11 where national security uh, interests abroad were discussed. Nobody thought, hey, maybe we should move some aircraft closer. Maybe we should should stand up a force uh, in preparation. The State Department's Air Agency um, FES team, the, the emergency support team, the foreign Foreign Emergency Support Team. That's their sole mission, to respond to diplomatic crisis worldwide. They, they, if they were notified, they never moved. 
They never activated that I could tell. Who, who did? There was a Marine fast team, the fleet area support team, which is a DOD asset. And these were the guys that changed uniforms at least three or four times and never left Road to Spain uh, until after the events were over. And Patrick Kennedy was giving the orders. Sorry, he's a State Department employee. Since when does State Department give DOD orders? None of this adds up. None of it makes sense. Uh, and, and they were woefully neglectful. It was dereliction of duty at the highest level. Well, if you delay long enough, it becomes a moot point because all the parties involved will be dead. And, uh, and that seems to be uh, about what, uh, what happened that night. Colonel, Colonel, would you stay with us? We have to take, take a short break here for commercial purposes, even on Independence Day. But I would like to, uh, to resume this discussion, and I think my co-host, J.D. Manier, may have a few questions for you as well. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. And around the world on the internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, and AM FM 24-7, the allinin.com. I am Kevin Wade, my co-host, J.D. Manier is with us, and uh, Colonel James Williamson is on the phone talking about uh, the conclusions some of the baffling conclusions of the Benghazi report. You stay with us. We'll continue this interview on the other side in about two minutes. I really don't care. That's my prerogative. They say I'm messy, but I... The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We are establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired of the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 on your AM dial, or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, CCRSNetwork.com, for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where now even more newsmakers go to be heard. David and Patty Berrickman of Wildflower Ridge Honey, beekeepers for 49 years. I want to tell you about a great survival in a multi-use product called Trail Rations. It is pure honey and a product of the USA. Trail Rations comes in a food grade 12 ounce, very durable and reusable pouch, ready for immediate use or for long term storage because honey is the only food that never spoils. Honey is instant energy and goes right straight to your bloodstream. Honey is one of the best all natural survival foods, natural sweetener right straight from Mother Nature. Honey is also antiviral, fungal, and bacterial. It's your first aid in a pouch. Carry one in your backpack or your bug out bag. Find us on Facebook, Wildflower Ridge Honey, or call 765 641 9972. 765 641 9972. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. If you would like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com. For 1 p.m., log on to RoarRadio.net, and at 9 p.m., log on to High Plains Daily News. For at midnight, at midnight, at midnight, log on to RitzTateTalkRadio.com, and you can listen to the conservative commandos from any phone anywhere on planet Earth by calling 832-999-1199. Uh, we've got more ways to communicate than the, uh, the White House crisis team did uh, on uh, September 11, 2012. Uh, Colonel Jamie Williamson, successful military career, former Delaware Blue Hand, uh, someone who uh, 
graduated from Special Forces in 1989, uh, is with us. And he's giving us his insight, a professional insight, into the baffling conclusions, baffling in my words, of the Select Committee on Benghazi. Uh, Colonel Williamson, thank you so much for staying with us. Anyway. Uh, my co-host, J.D. Manier, has a question for you. J.D.? Well, actually, probably two parts to this. Thank you so much, Kevin and Colonel Williamson. Agent 10 said that it was a suicide mission, and, and I think he reported this uh, often. He kept telling everybody back there, we don't have the security. This is a suicide mission. I want you to comment on that, and then I have a follow-up. Well, there were over 600 requests that went from that mission, from Ambassador Stevens to the State Department, either through him or through the DSS agents, all of them were ignored. It went from 28 agents in Tripoli down to six. Uh, the, the British ambassador, there was an attempt on his life earlier that week. They, uh, they had already thrown a dis an explosive device into the diplomatic compound, into ours. The U.S. flag was the only diplomatic flag flying in Benghazi on 9-11. So everyone believed that attack was imminent. They had identified, I believe, at least seven uh, extremist Islamic groups that were operating in and around Trip or, uh, Benghazi. Uh, so, yeah, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. It was almost a foregone conclusion that they were going to be attacked. Well, my, my last part of this is, you know, Donald Trump has assailed Hillary and Obama for, for basically they were gun running. A lot of those weapons ended up in the hands of what is now ISIS. And it, it was failed policy up there in Syria, and they were making it worse. And uh, uh, go ahead and comment on that very fact, what they were doing. It, it, it certainly is. It looks to be fairly uh, apparent that they were using uh, the diplomatic uh uh, facility as, as diplomatic top cover for the agency's operation, what later became known as the annex uh, a mile away or so. Um, but Libya was, was supposed to be the crown jewel of Hillary Clinton's foreign policy, uh, and it turned out to be a disastrous failure. What, what really irks me and angers me is, is the arrogance and hubris of not only her, but the president's office to deliberately lie to the American people, not to cover up secrets, but to cover up their own political failures uh, and to believe that they could get away with it. If, if it wasn't for this investigation and, and OPSEC was, was uh, a dominant, played a dominant role in the establishment of the select committee, uh, we had spent about 10 days on Capitol Hill petitioning Congress uh, and getting co-sponsors for Frank Wolf's uh, House Resolution 36. And I think we, we took the co-signers from a dozen to about 124, I think. But there was a failure of will at all levels. Uh, from the National Security Council to Secretary Clinton. Uh, plenty of blame to go around at the highest levels of government. Now, what was different about uh, the events in Benghazi and the the takedown of Osama bin Laden when there were, uh, you know, the, the president and the vice president and the whole security team were gathered around their monitors to watch in real time. Lots of press coverage, lots of images coming out of, about a commander in chief with, with hands on control. What was different? What was different about Benghazi? Well, nobody leaked secrets about Benghazi. Uh, you know, that was... Uh the first of May, and, and uh, you know, you would think that President Obama had loaded ammunition and fueled the helicopters, and it was I, 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 like he had uh, killed uh, Bin Laden himself. Uh, but yeah, they were they were happy to take credit for that. But when their own foreign policy failed and killed four Americans, that you know they tried to back away from it. They got Susan Rice to carry their water and lied to the American people and threw her under the bus. 
uh, but uh, yeah, that's the, the, the whole Benghazi thing w- was what sparked the impetus for the creation of OPSEC. We are a 501c4. Yeah, let's uh, talk about that. Let's talk about that. Explain to our audience exactly what the organization is, what you do, and why why it's important that they get involved. Yeah, so we're, we're a, a 501c4. We're a nonpartisan grassroots uh, advocacy to protect U.S. Special Operations Forces, SOF, and uh, American intelligence officers from exploitation through poor foreign policy or uh, from the uh, illegal uh, disclosure of classified. Uh, good example of that is what was in Petraeus's diaries. Uh, another good example is all the, uh, the top secret and special access program uh, information that was found on Mrs. Clinton's personal server. And uh, how can our listeners in, in this final minute uh, lend a hand with your good works? How can they show support? Well, uh, I, w- I would encourage everybody to go to our website. It's www.opsecteam.org. It's O-P-S-E-C. Uh, you'll be able to see the kind of history from uh, from our inception and some of the causes that we've taken up. We we made uh, about a 20-minute video called Dishonorable Disclosures, which went viral, had millions of hits, uh, and provoked a response from President Obama within 72 hours. Uh, we didn't anticipate that, but the administration did kind of shut up and stop filling a lot of the secrets that they were trying to get political leverage of, but you don't do that by putting U.S. intelligence officers at risk. Colonel Williamson, thank you so much for your service. Thank you for sharing part of this Independence Day with with our audience. God bless you for your service in uniform and your important service since. You are always welcome back on this show. God bless America. Thank you for having me. Thank you. J.D., great guest, very appropriate for uh, for this 4th of July. We still must fight for our freedoms. And, and the truth will set us free as a nation, and he's helping to, to open that up. Uh, the, the terrible failings of, of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. J.D., we've got to go into a break. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. And around on the world on the internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeartRadio, and AMF and 24 slash 7, the all in and dot com. I'm Kevin Wade. J.D. Meneer's with me. You're with us. Thank you for spending part of your 4th of July with us. We will be right back. NJC, Washington Township, Philadelphia, 1360. This is Rick Trader, host of the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. And I'm John Forsyth, owner of WNJC Radio. Fellow patriots, the Conservative Commandos Radio Show is for conservatives, about conservatives, and by conservatives. We are patriots who want to take our country back from the likes of Barack Obama, Harry Reid, George Soros, and Nancy Pelosi. But we can't keep up this fight without your critical support today. Can you help? Please go to www.helpccrs.com right now and make a donation by credit card or PayPal. That's www.helpccrs.com. Our goal is to expose the liberal agenda and distortions. We are fighting to spread the truth about political issues, political leaders, and conservative issues and values. Our hosts are not paid. In fact, we buy our own airtime, studio time, and pay our own expenses. We created the show because we are trying to make a difference. So can you help the CCRS expose the truth in 2014 and beyond? 
go to www.helpccrs.com. Help keep the Conservative Commandos radio show on the air by going to www.helpccrs.com and make a donation today to return our country to the conservative roots created by our founding fathers. 9-11, it's a day that will go down in our history as the most horrific and destructive scene ever to happen on American soil. It will also be, for most Americans who witnessed it either up close or simply watched in horror on TV, America to participate in a national memorial I call the United Action of Prayer this coming 9-11 and every 9-11 from then on. United Action of Prayer is simply every American stopping whatever they are doing for one minute at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or pray in memory for the 9-11 victims and their families and perhaps a prayer of gratitude for living in a country where even 9-11 could not at all weaken the spirit of our great nation. If you're in a crash and have little cash, come to AJ Auto Body. We handle insurance claims fast and repairs are guaranteed to last at AJ Auto Body. Come check us out and without a doubt, you'll be satisfied. That's AJ Auto Body, 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. Family owned and operated for 30 years. We are a fully licensed and insured auto repair facility located at 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. We are your friend in the business. So stop in for a free estimate or call us at 856-251-0096. Check us out on the web at www.ajautobody.net. That's where you'll find our specials, discounts, and coupons. For all your car needs, come to AJ Auto Body, located at 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. 856-251-0096. What does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCS4Automation.com. That's PCS, the number four, automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 a.m. or around the world on the internet at wnjcradio.com check out our website conservative commandos radio network.com and ccrn.com for rebroadcasts and network updates we are the conservative commandos radio network where even more newsmakers go to be heard from the east coast to the West Coast, and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 
227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Hey, thanks for staying with us. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our websites, ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com, or 1 p.m. log on to roarradio.net. And at 9 p.m., log on to highplainsdailynews.com at midnight for you guys who can't sleep. Log on to redstatetalkradio.com, and now you can listen to the conservative commandos from any phone on planet Earth, any place, by calling 832-999-1199. J.D., it is uh, the 4th of July, and uh, hey, I want to thank you, my co-hosts, for making time uh, to, to spend with our listeners, J.D., Oh, it's been a privilege. It always is, Kevin, working with you. And uh, I, I'm very happy to let you know that our next guest is on the line and, and ready to, uh, to to talk with us. And, J.D., would you please take the honor of making his introduction and leading the interview? Well, Dr. Calvin Beisner is founder and national spokesman of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. He's the author of a dozen books and over a 1,000 articles former associate professor of historical theology and social ethics at Knox Theological Seminary and of interdisciplinary studies at Covenant College. Welcome back to the Conservative Commander Radio Show, Dr. Beisner. Yes, thank you very much. Great to be back with you, especially on, on a day like today, the 240th birthday of the United States of America. Wonderful day. Dr. Beisner, I, I was in Indianapolis this weekend. I'm, I'm with family in lovely Warsaw, Indiana, a few hours north. But over the weekend in Indianapolis, it was reported that our high was a record low. And so you've written this article about climate science, energy policy, poverty, and Christian faith, and how they all connect. You're not a climate scientist yourself, but but go ahead and let's talk about this issue. People are very, very much interested. Yeah, uh, that is correct. I'm not a climate scientist myself. Now, I have read over 50 books on the science of climate change and thousands and thousands of articles on it, uh, specializing in this for the last 10 years, and uh, about 40 books on the science and economics of of climate and energy policy. Uh, So I, I think I do know pretty well what I'm talking about. But I'm backed up by the fact that we have in the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation a network of about 60 scholars. Uh, Roughly a third of them are theologians and ethicists like myself. Uh, A third are economists of either environment or development. And then uh, uh, the other third are natural scientists, including a good many uh, climate scientists, uh, such as Dr. Roy Spencer, who is a principal research scientist in climatology at the University of Alabama and runs the most reliable uh, global temperature uh, monitoring system that we have in the world, uh, the one done by NASA from its satellites. Uh, so, you know, we, we have people who, who are behind me, and I'm able to go to them for really solid information. But, you know, what, what concerns me, what motivates me on all of this is that uh, the policies that are being promoted to, uh, to try to reduce human influence on global warming uh, are policies that will trap the poor in poverty for generations to come. And, and I think that's morally reprehensible, especially when we recognize that poverty is a far greater risk to human health and life than anything connected with climate. If, if you're even tolerably well off, uh, say like America's uh, bottom quintile, bottom 20% of earners in America, uh, you can thrive in any climate from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert, but if you're really poor, uh, like people in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Latin America and Asia, uh, you can't thrive in the very best of climates. So we need to really focus on, on seeing what lifts whole societies out of poverty, not on trying to fight climate change. And unfortunately, trying to fight climate change actually involves denying people access to the very things that that are most important to lifting them out of poverty. Yes. I, I mean, here in Indiana, we, we rely on about 80 to 85 percent coal to generate our electricity. And if mm-hmm. we get Obama's uh, desires fully implemented, you're going to at least double the cost of electricity for the poor people. So amen to what you're doing. You know, in your article, you discuss how some people use dramatically colored graphs 
convey information about temperature trends. How do those sometimes distort reality? Well, uh, I, I point out, and I actually reproduce a couple of graphs from another article to which in, in large part I'm responding with uh, in, in this one. Uh, and my article, by the way, is in the June edition of the World Commerce Report. Um, so people can find that online at worldcommercereport.com. Uh, the, the, the thing that a lot of climate alarmists will do is they'll create graphs showing anomalies from average temperature over some particular period of time. And they'll show the warmer anomalies in red and the cooler anomalies in blue and then, you know, various shades and colors between those two. Well, you know, frankly, that's a kind of a rhetorical trick or a psychological trick. We all associate red with danger and, and urgency. Uh, you know, red stoplights and, and uh, red lights on, on ambulances and fire trucks and things like that. If instead you map exactly the same numbers, the same data, in grayscale, all of the alarming appearance disappears. And that's actually far more representative of the way the numbers themselves are because the anomalies, these differences from average that we're talking about are not swings of you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees. These are swings of a fraction of one degree in global average temperature. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the, the amount that it's estimated that the world has warmed in the last hundred years is about eight-tenths of a degree. Uh, that's certainly not something that is going to cause any great harm anywhere. And as a matter of fact, it's more likely to cause more good than harm. So uh, it was just simply a point that I made in the article that uh, we need to be careful that we're not psychologically tricked by the very artistic way in which numbers can be presented. Well, not only that, but, but just ribald lying and cheating. Uh, I mean, more and more reports have come out that they're fudging uh, the temperature readings. And, and you've got to admit, uh, the way and how you do a temperature read, and let's say in a city, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Here we are on the 4th of July, 240 years into our nation's independence. I mean, there was only 30,000 people in New York City back then, and they yeah. shouldn't have the same kind of measuring devices we have today. No, and they certainly didn't have the amount of, of uh, heat-trapping asphalt on the streets and things like that. You know, there's what's called the urban heat island effect, and uh, several different studies uh, by major uh, uh, climatologists and uh, statisticians indicate that a good 50%, possibly as much as 70% of all the warming over the last roughly a century uh, shown in the various different databases uh, can be explained by the fact that that more and more uh, thermometer stations are within cities where you get this urban heat island effect. Uh, and what, what then gets done is that uh, organizations like NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or the NCDC, the National Climatic Data uh, Centers, um, they will do what they call homogenizing of data. And, you know, frankly, that's legitimate in principle. Uh, you use different instrumentation. You have uh, temperatures taken at different times of day and whatnot around the world. And so you need to homogenize the data. You need to try to account for those differences. The problem is that over the past five years or so, in, increasingly often what we're discovering is that when the scientists who do this uh, homogenize the data, there's a very consistent trend. They make older temperatures seem lower and more recent temperatures seem higher. That is, they're adjusting them that way. But if the, if the mistakes were random, then we should expect the corrections to be as often up as down at any given date in any given place. Uh, so what it really looks like is they're, they're intentionally uh, creating the appearance of more warming than has actually happened. That's not to say that there hasn't been any warming at all. Even the satellite data, which are far and away the most reliable that we have, they show a warming trend of, oh, approximately uh, a little bit less than one uh, degree per century Celsius. 
Um, that's certainly not going to be harmful to anybody. It's, it's basically going to be good. Uh, but we're not saying there's no warming. We're not deniers like Holocaust deniers. We're saying that the warming is far less than what the alarmists uh, want people to believe. Well, we're coming up against a hard break. Uh, can you hold with us just a couple minutes? Sure, Tim. And uh, Kevin's going to take us out and look forward to continuing this great conversation with you. Thank you, J.D. If you would like to hear a uh, rebroadcast, actually, let me do it this way. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC, 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. And around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, and AM slash FM 24 slash 7, theolandon.com. I'm Kevin Wade. J.D. Manier is sharing hosting duties. You stay with us. We will be right back on this 4th of July. Crazy. I really don't care. That's my The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We are establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired of the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 on your AM dial, or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, CCRSNetwork.com, for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where now even more newsmakers go to be heard. David and Patty Berrickman of Wildflower Ridge Honey, beekeepers for 49 years. I want to tell you about a great survival and a multi-use product called Trail Rations. It is pure honey and a product in the USA. Trail Rations comes in a food-grade 12-ounce, very durable and reusable pouch, ready for immediate use or for long-term storage because honey is the only food that never spoils. Honey is instant energy and goes right straight to your bloodstream. Honey is one of the best all-natural survival foods, natural sweetener right straight from Mother Nature. Honey is also antiviral, fungal, and bacterial. It's your first aid in a pouch. Carry one in your backpack or your bug-out bag. Find us on Facebook, Wildflower Ridge Honey, or call 765-641-9972, 765-641-9972. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. If you would like to uh, hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com. Or at 1 p.m., log on to roarradio.net, R-O-A-R radio.net. At 9 p.m., log on to highplainsdailynews.com. And at midnight, log on to redstatetalkradio.com. And you can listen to the Conservative Commandos from any phone by calling 832 832- Nine nine nine, eleven ninety nine. Uh, JD, please pick up this interview with uh, Mr. Beisner. Talk about this climate scientist. Okay, what do climate science mean? That's my question. The hiatus in this global warming. Talk about how long this has been going on. What, what are they? What are they referring to? Yeah, uh, what they're referring to is the fact that. Um, there was no statistically significant warming trend in global average temperature from early 1997 to almost the very end of 2015. Um, And that's important because the computer models, which are the only basis for predictions about how much the world is going to warm because of adding CO2 to the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels for energy, those computer models uh, predict... uh, two to three times as much warming as actually observed over the relevant periods. 95% of them 
can predict more warming than actually observed, and if the errors were random, uh, then, then they would be as often below as above the observations. This indicates that the errors are not random, but driven by some sort of bias. And none of them predicted that fact, that there was no warming at all from early 97 to the end of 2015, basically 18 years, 9 or 10 months. Um, that means the models are wrong, and they therefore give no rational basis for any predictions about future temperature and no rational basis for any policy, such as the clean power plan that the Obama administration has put through here in the United States or the uh, Paris Climate Agreement that, uh, that was worked out in December and began to be ratified in uh, uh, April at the United Nations. Um, so we, we need to recognize there just is not good scientific basis for those sorts of predictions. And what happens is that uh, the folks who are in the alarmist camp on this will, will call that a pause in global warming. But that, of course, prejudges that the warming is going to continue afterward. Uh, we frankly don't know that until, until we come to the afterward. And we could actually see cooling begin instead. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of, of scientists uh, especially solar physicists who think that we are probably headed for that because the sun is entering into a what is typically called a, a quiet period or a, uh, a minimum, a solar minimum uh, that would result in some significant cooling of the earth similar to what we saw in what was called the Little Ice Age that ran oh, from roughly 1350 or 1400 to about 1850. Uh, a period during which, at least in the uh, late 17th century anyway, there were ice parties on the Thames in, uh, in uh, December and January, uh, and there certainly haven't been anything like that in the last couple of centuries. Hey, our host, uh, Kevin's got a couple questions for you. Uh, Dr. Beisner, uh, there are some very simple questions that failed to get asked. Uh, one is, uh, you know, have we experienced climate change in this earth in the past? Simple question. Oh, yes, uh, definitely. Climate always changes. That's the one constant, is that there's nothing constant about climate. It's and and the, the the there's a certain segment that or, wants you know, to focus there, on there carbon dioxide. Is that correct? Of stasis. And there's, there's a certain segment uh, of the scientific community, and certainly the political community, that wants to focus on carbon dioxide as being some culprit yep. in, in, in accelerating or, in fact, to creating climate change uh, at the moment. Yep. And yet... When did carbon dioxide begin to be uh, released into the atmosphere by man, by humankind? I'd say 1900, perhaps, with the onset of large uses of coal. Would that be fair? Uh, well, of course, all animal life breathes out carbon dioxide anyway. <laughs> you know, when you, when you inhale, you're bringing in about 400 parts per million CO2. When you exhale, you're bre breathing out about 40,000 parts per million CO2. But of course, that's not, <laughs> not a major contributor. The significant increase in carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere really was driven by our use of coal, especially, and then also oil and natural gas. Coal really beginning around the period of the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, and uh, natural gas and oil in the late 1900, late 1800s. Um, they, they, we didn't release enough to be able to say it would likely have much impact on temperature until the late 20th century. Uh, but now let's also talk about just what kind of quantities we're talking about here. At the time of the Industrial Revolution, CO2 probably made up about 28 thousandths of 1% of the atmosphere. Today, it makes about 40 thousandths of 1% of the atmosphere. So it's gone up by 42%, but from 28 thousandths of 1% to 40 thousandths of 1%. So it's still not a huge part of the atmosphere, and it continues to be uh, pretty much a bit player in controlling the temperature of the Earth. Uh, solar activity and water vapor are far more important, and, and clouds far more important than CO2. And, and I would... Again. Oh, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Keep and, and I would challenge those on the left who have really gone hook, line, and sinker on, on the carbon dioxide death story uh, to, to, to provide uh, evidence that it's only been since the advent of, of man's use of hydrocarbons in large ways 
say the last 100, 150 years. It's only in the last 150 years we've ever, we've ever seen climate change. But it's always with us. And, uh, and I will also point out that uh, of all the carbon dioxide that is released into the environment in a year, uh, man-generated carbon dioxide is not the greatest portion. It's significant, but it is natural sources of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that predominate. That is correct. And by the way, too, there's also a tremendous benefit from carbon dioxide in addition to the fact that it helps keep the atmosphere warm enough for, for human and plant life and animal life to thrive. Uh, that is, carbon dioxide is frankly the gas of life. Uh, all plants need carbon dioxide in order to do, you know, to do photosynthesis. And the more CO2 there is in the air in which the plants grow, the better they grow. Uh, for every doubling of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you get an average 35% increase in plant growth efficiency. And the result is more food for everything that eats plants and everything that eats things that eat plants. And the ones uh, among people who benefit the most are the poor because food prices come down. And that's a very important thing for us to keep in mind. Carbon dioxide is not, properly speaking, a pollutant. It is the absolute elixir of, of life. And, 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 and in order to save mankind about uh, uh, $700 million a year in, in unneeded research costs, I'll give everyone a, a, a backyard example of what, in fact, affects the temperature in the atmosphere on this planet. If you go to Key West, any time of the year, it's very humid. And that temperature only changes in that town about 10 degrees from the warmest part of the day to the coolest part of the night, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. But you go to the deserts of northern Mexico or the Mojave or the Sahara, any desert in the world where the humidity is not 82%, but more like 12%. And when the sun goes down, even though you're at exactly the same latitude and the sun strikes the planet Earth at exactly the same incidence, the same angle, in those areas without water vapor, the temperature can drop 25, 35, and 45 degrees day after day after day when nighttime falls. Falls. The difference is there's no water vapor in the atmosphere to hold the heat. That is correct, and this is why, frankly, the whole fear of dangerous global warming being driven by CO2 emissions is completely unfounded. The reality is that the economic development made possible by the abundant, affordable, reliable energy from fossil fuels is indispensable to lifting and keeping any society out of poverty. This is why the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation holds the positions that we do on this. We have a number of major papers by outstanding scholars on this at our website, cornwallalliance.org. We also have an open letter to the American people and their, their elected representatives about climate change. Uh, that also is at you know, cornwallalliance.org. And we also have recently released a new documentary video called Where the Grass is Greener, Biblical Stewardship versus Climate Alarmism. That is at where the grass is greener the movie.com. That's where the grass is greener the movie.com. Dr. Biden, J.D. Manier, and, and we want to thank you and say God bless on this 4th of July, Independence Day, for coming on the Concerted Commanders Radio Show. Great. Thanks very much, and God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. And around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting Talk Stream Live. SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, AM, FM 24-7. I'm Kevin Wade, J.D. Meneers with us. Thank you for spending part of your 4th of July with us on Conservative Commandos. We'll be right back for the final guest of the first show of this week. Stay with us. This is Rick Trader, host of the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. And I'm John Forsyth, owner of WNJC Radio, fellow patriots. 
The Conservative Commandos radio show is for conservatives, about conservatives, and by conservatives. We are patriots who want to take our country back from the likes of Barack Obama, Harry Reid, George Soros, and Nancy Pelosi. But we can't keep up this fight without your critical support today. Can you help? Please go to www.helpccrs.com right now and make a donation by credit card or PayPal. That's www.helpccrs.com. Our goal is to expose the liberal agenda and distortions. We are fighting to spread the truth about political issues, political leaders, and conservative issues and values. Our hosts are not paid. In fact, we buy our own airtime, studio time, and pay our own expenses. We created the show because we are trying to make a difference. So can you help the CCRS expose the truth in 2014 and beyond? Go to www.helpccrs.com. Help keep the Conservative Commandos radio show on the air by going to www.helpccrs.com and make a donation today to return our country to the conservative roots created by our founding fathers. 9-11. It's a day that will go down in our history as the most horrific and destructive scene ever to happen on American soil. It will also be, for most Americans who witnessed it either up close or simply watched in horror on TV, America to participate in a national memorial I call the United Action of Prayer this coming 9-11 and every 9-11 from then on. United Action of Prayer is simply every American stopping whatever they are doing for one minute at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or pray in memory for the 9-11 victims and their families and perhaps a prayer of gratitude for living in a country where even 9-11 could not at all weaken the spirit of our great nation. If you're in a crash and have little cash, come to AJ Auto Body. We handle insurance claims fast and repairs are guaranteed to last at AJ Auto Body. Come check us out and without a doubt, you'll be satisfied. That's AJ Auto Body, 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. Family owned and operated for 30 years. We are a fully licensed and insured auto repair facility located at 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. We are your friend in the business. So stop in for a free estimate or call us at 856-251-0096. Check us out on the web at www.ajautobody.net. That's where you'll find our specials, discounts, and coupons. For all your car needs, come to AJ Auto Body, located at 1345 Delcy Drive in Deptford, New Jersey. 856-251-0096. What does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCS4Automation.com. That's PCS, the number four, automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 a.m. or around the world on the internet at wnjcradio.com. 
Check out our website, conservativecommandosradionetwork.com and ccrn.com for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where even more newsmakers go to be heard. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Hey, thank you for staying with us on this 4th of July. I'm Kevin Wade. J.D. Muneer, the patriot of the great state of Indiana, is with us. Uh... It means a lot. It means a lot this day. It's uh, it's it's the, the country's birthday, and uh, th- those great men back then had no idea how that experiment that they were beginning would turn out. But they did know that if they failed in the revolution, they were going to be hanged by the king's men. But they were brave, and we do need brave patriots today even more than then. So... Uh, Thank you for staying with us on this show and being with us and being part of the audience. Hey, our next guest is uh, Howard Hyde. He's an ex-liberal socialist progressive Democrat from Berkeley. Let me say that again. He's an ex-liberal socialist progressive Democrat from Berkeley. Okay, how'd we get him? <laughs> He's the author of the book, Pull the Plug on Obamacare, and his latest book is Escape from Berkeley, an ex-liberal progressive socialist embraces america and does not apologize and i think that's enough of an intro howard hyde you are uh, one of our colleagues you host your own show on this network and uh, thank you for spending some time with us on this independence day well uh thanks very much it's great to be here and uh happy independence day to you and to all of our listeners today uh thank you uh we we return the warm regards uh Tell us about your book, Escape from Berkeley, and then I think we want to move over to talk a little bit more about climate change, but tell us how you had to escape from Berkeley. Well, uh, the book uh, basically deconstructs the radical leftist movements of the 1960s in places like my hometown of of Berkeley and uh, connects the dots to what's happening today because so much of what we're suffering from, the the Great Recession, the stagnating economy, the, uh, the... the, the jobs uh, outlook and, and even you know crime and terrorism and our responses to it uh, have uh, deep roots in places like Berkeley in the 60s and what happened there, uh, which led to the radical left as opposed to the reasonable left uh, taking over first the Democratic Party and then eventually infiltrating through uh, all levels of government, all agencies and all uh, institutions of our society. When did you see this happening? When did you when did you have that aha moment, the Eureka moment? Well, it, as I write in the book, it wasn't one Eureka moment. Uh, it, I was uh, about 19 years old before I had ever heard the uh, conservative free market explanation of economics. Uh, all, you know, my entire youth, uh, growing up in uh, you know, Berkeley and and going to Berkeley High School and and stuff like that, in the aftermath of the great upheavals on the university campus, uh, all I got was the, the socialist, the anti-American feed. You know, uh, capitalism is a system of the exploitation of the poor for the benefit of the rich, and businessmen are greedy and don't pay enough taxes, and corporations just pollute the environment and earn obscene profits, you know, yada, blah, etc. So, in 1980, Milton Friedman came out with his Free to Choose uh, television series on PBS. And uh, that was something of an eye-opener. It was the the first seed that had ever been planted that maybe there was a different way of looking at just how the economy works and how 
the, the most prosperity can be brought to the greatest number of people. And it was actually a journey of 12 more years before I finally said, okay, that's it. I am a conservative, free market, uh, pro-capitalist Republican <laughs> now. It, uh, I, I'm, I'm done with this uh, leftist vision that I was uh, uh, marinated in and, and uh, you know, raised in. Was it a matter that as you kind of ripened and wisened in your life, you kept finding one more example of the liberal litany that just well, yes. didn't hold up in, in the framework of your own real-world experiences? A study of uh, philosophy and history and economic theory uh, I lived in France for four years during the 80s under the uh, socialist the regime of uh, President François Mitterrand, and I got a front row seat to the the day-to-day -day reality of life under a socialist economy. I, I love France, I love the wine, I love the cheese, I, I, I love the girls, but uh, uh, economically, you know, not so much. I mean, they've got... Uh, They've got unemployment, they've got uh, a uh, standard of living that's far below ours, and you know, it, it was a, it was a wake-up call. And then when I returned to the United States, uh, uh, moving from Northern California to Southern California, uh, I almost had a heart attack seeing all the for-rent signs, you know, move in today, first month free. I mean, uh, such things were in, uh, impossible to imagine in, in a rent-controlled city like Paris, where it, it would take you six months or a year to find uh, a, a place that... A, a place to rent that was uh, fit for human habitation. <laughs> so, um, but uh, the the next major philosopher after uh, Milton Friedman for me was Julian Simon of the Cato Institute, who had written a book titled "The uh, The Ultimate Resource," in which he debunked 200 years of cli uh, climate and environmental and resource scares, kind of tying into your theme there, uh, and and saying that. You know, it's coal and oil and natural gas and food and, and all this stuff. None of that matters if you don't have three human beings living under the rule of law with private property rights. That is the ultimate resource, and that's what we're running out of, not any of these other things. Uh, my co-host, J.D. Manier, has a quick question for you. J.D.? Sure. It's great being with you. Hey, this year marks that 10-year clock countdown where Al Gore said that we were going to be frying here uh, in 2016. And yeah, well, I, I took that apart in a, in a piece about a year ago for um, frontpagemag.com in a, an article titled, Climate Change, Where is the Science? And there, there were several predictions that were made about 10 to 15 years ago, none of which came true. And yet today, the the uh, the, the, uh, the climate global warmongers uh, would have us believe that they are still as omniscient as they ever were, and that uh, if we disagree with them, we're not just wrong, but we're as evil as somebody who uh, denies that the Holocaust ever took place. So, what role does... Does liberalism continue to, to, to exist in, in the political world because there are some who just refuse to, to accept the experiences in life that you have? Or is it because liberals continue to look for a new generation of the gullible? Uh, that's a very good question. Why does, why does it endure? Uh, it endures because the radical left has been uh, very aggressive in... I mean, they, they know exactly what they're doing. There, there's the difference between the hardcore radical left true believers and the large volume of rather uh, confused, uh, you know, going along to getting along people. Uh, it's, it's, it's fashionable, especially where I live in Southern California. You have Hollywood. You've got you know, the basic California culture. Uh, people aren't thinking in very... Uh, serious ways about these things. I mean, we, we've got, uh, you know, jobs and, and business are hemorrhaging out of this state, and yet they, do, they keep, uh, you know, Sacramento keeps passing laws uh, to raise the minimum wage and to increase the burdens on business and, and increase regulation, and, and now there's, uh, you know, massive uh, move toward uh, gun grabbing and so forth. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a movement that has as I say, it's it, it infiltrated all levels of our government and all of our institutions of, of our society, and the elites who run it are, are very 
skilled, very dedicated uh, to what they do, and they've uh, successfully so far kept millions of uh, of liberals and you know more uh, you know, going along to getting along people to kind of uh, follow uh, follow in their uh, you know their guidelines. Howard, uh, we have a short commercial break to take. Would you stay with us so we can continue this conversation on the other side? Absolutely. Howard Hyde is here, and he's talking about his latest book, and we'll talk a little bit about climate change when he comes back. You stay with us. Uh, We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC, 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. You stay with us. We'll be back in just about two and a half minutes. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We are establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired of the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 on your AM dial, or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, CCRSNetwork.com, for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where now even more newsmakers go to be heard. David and Patty Berrickman of Wildflower Ridge Honey, beekeepers for 49 years. I want to tell you about a great survival in a multi-use product called Trail Rations. It is pure honey and a product of the USA. Trail Rations comes in a food-grade 12-ounce, very durable and reusable pouch, ready for immediate use or for long-term storage because honey is the only food that never spoils. Honey is instant energy and goes right straight to your bloodstream. Honey is one of the best all-natural survival foods, natural sweetener right straight from Mother Nature. Honey is also antiviral, fungal, and bacterial. It's your first aid in a pouch. Carry one in your backpack or your bug-out bag. Find us on Facebook, Wildflower Ridge Honey, or call 765-641-9972, 765-641-9972. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. If you would like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, CCRS Network and CCRShow.com. At 1 p.m., log on to RoarRadio.net. At 9 p.m., log on to HighPlainsDailyNews.com or at midnight. If you're like a night owl kind of guy, at midnight, log on to RedStateTalkRadio.com. And you can listen to the conservative commandos from any phone by calling 832-999-1199. Howard Hyde, one of our colleagues on the conservative commandos radio network, decided to, well, share some of his Independence Day with us. And he's here now. Howard, thank you for staying with us. Uh, we're coming up in the final eight minutes of the show, and I wanted to talk uh, at, after the break right now, uh, if you would, about where is the science to climate change? <laughs> well, uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, basically what what's going on in our public <clears throat> arena right now with regard to climate change has nothing to do with science and everything to do with politics and power. You know, just follow the money. If, if you are a scientist and uh, you have doubts about whether anthropomorphic, uh, you know, fossil fuel burning is a primary driver of climate change or global warming, uh, you don't get hired. If you get hired, you get harassed. 
Uh, you don't get the research money. It's all driven by political concern. And uh, there is a political impetus toward finding one conclusion to the question about whether or not mankind has influence uh, over, over the climate. And there is only one answer that uh, the politicians who fund the research want to hear. Is that correct? Well, that's right. And, and besides, they want to boil it down to a single variable, which is you know, CO of carbon dioxide, which is the most absurd thing you can imagine in science that just one variable is driving the entire thing. I mean, there's volcanic activity, there's tectonic activity, there's sunspots, and, and uh, you know, uh, Dr. Um, Spoon has done uh, excellent research on the b behavior of the sun. Uh, we have a record of um, uh, carbon dioxide actually being a trailing indicator of uh, global warming. That is the Warming comes first, and then a couple of thousand years later comes the uh, elevated uh, carbon dioxide. So, I mean, the idea that we boil this immensely complex system, which, you know, we can't even predict the weather, uh, basically, of uh, more than a week out, and yet, uh, based on one variable, we're going to say what's, what's happening for the next hundred years, and the uh, science is settled. Well... If the science is settled, then let's close all the laboratories and fire all the research scientists because there's nothing more for them to do. Well, actually, if, if you actually take a look at some of the papers, as I have, most of the papers that are written and funded by the government in this area do not draw a conclusion that man, man in, its, in his release of carbon dioxide is changing the climate. They look, most of these papers are very legitimate. They take a look at some very, very, very narrow uh, slice of, uh, say, ocean bed sediments, uh, the history of the weather that's is shown in certain isotopes in the rocks. They're all glad to be funded uh, by those who, who seek a, a conclusion that it's uh, anthropogenic global warming. But very few of the legitimate scientists will, will come to that conclusion, almost none. Now, what do they universally agree on is more money is needed for more research because their kids, you know, have to go through college, too. But it's actually the politicians and the headline grabbers who have actually distorted some of the papers that have been released. I'd say the vast majority of scientists, if they had to state in public uh, and, and were threatened with the loss of the research money, would, would, would claim that mankind is changing the planet's uh, climate. But I think if you ask them in private in a way that uh, Big Brother couldn't record their name and punish them, I think they'd say, we really don't know. That's my two cents. Yeah, and uh, the, I, I had the uh, honor of attending the Heartland Institute's uh, climate change conference last year, and there were a couple of hundreds of masters and PhD uh, scientists who were not at all on board with the political consensus that uh, humans are to blame, and there's just this one variable. There's a, there's a very dynamic uh, and healthy scientific debate actually going on if we would only uh, allow it to happen and encourage it rather than trying to uh, bully people to come up with the right politically correct uh, conclusion. One more comment on carbon dioxide. You know, we could use more carbon dioxide in California right now because plants, to get more carbon dioxide, need less water to survive and to thrive. And we're in the middle of a drought right now, and our crops are suffering uh, pretty badly. So we, we could actually use more carbon dioxide here. <laughs> well, we, 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 had a, we, had a, we had a guest on earlier, and today's show was on a similar subject. And I raised the obvious that it's water vapor overwhelms the influence of, uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, yes, water vapor is the number one greenhouse gas, which uh, provides, uh, it presents a conundrum for the, the people who want to make political hay out of this. Are they going to de declare uh, that water now is a pollutant? Uh, they'll get around to that after they bankrupted uh, mankind with their controls of carbon dioxide. But, but the example is so easy. The example is so easy, and, and you don't have to have gone to college for 12 years to, to understand this. Right. Carbon dioxide is, for all intents and purposes, evenly distributed in the atmosphere all over the planet. Water vapor isn't. Hmm. Okay, now if you've ever been in the Mojave Desert, and I haven't, 
but I have been to some desert areas off the coast of Africa, and I've also been to the deserts of of northern Mexico, uh, where the humidity is in the order of 15 and 18 and 20 percent. Yep. In those areas where the carbon dioxide has the same concentration as every place else on the planet, in those areas where there's no humidity to speak of, the temperature will drop 25 and 35 degrees between yes. midday and midnight. And that's true in the Mojave, the Sahara, the northern deserts of, uh, of, of, of Mexico, the deserts in the interior of Australia. And yet if you go to, to Key West, Florida, which is at the same latitude as some of these deserts and has the same carbon dioxide, year-round the temperature won't change 10 degrees Fahrenheit between the warmest part of the day and the coolest part of the night. The difference is the ability of water vapor to trap heat. So now we can send all the scientists home and save money. <laughs> yep, let's do it. <laughs> Howard, tell our uh, tell our listeners who don't follow your show when your show is broadcast on the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. Uh, I believe it's, it, it it has bounced around a couple of times, but I think we've settled on uh, Wednesdays at uh, five p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, 2 p.m. Western Time, and you can get it on my website as well at citizenecon.com. Uh, it's uh, available to listen to at any time after the broadcast. And how can they um, get? To, uh, how, how can they come across? How can they buy? To be really blatantly commercial, one of your books. Yeah, it's available on Amazon.com. Escape from Berkeley: An Ex-Liberal Progressive Socialist Embraces America and Doesn't Apologize. And you can also get the other options for uh, supporting my work and getting uh, uh, autographed copies at my website. Again, www.citizenecon.com. Howard Hyde, thank you so much for spending part of your Independence Day with our audience. Thanks so much for having me. J.D. Manier, we're coming up in the last minute. Hey, Kevin, I, I just want to you know thank our guest and you, Jamie Williamson. The, the first guest, and then Dr. Calvin Beisner, and of course Howard Hyde. You know, we hit we hit the climate change pretty hard, but we have a president in our 240th year as a country still claiming the greatest threat to America is this climate change, which is which is why we we want to tell the truth. And yeah, I'll leave and, it up to you. The, that's when he's not saying that you and I are the greatest threat. That conservatives <laughs> and people who believe in the Constitution and our our Bill of Rights are the big, biggest threat. <laughs> Mr. Hyde, thank you very much. Hey, we're coming to the end of the show. It has been an honor to be with you, J.D. Mr. Hyde, an honor to be with you. And mostly we want to thank our audience for spending part of your Independence Day with us. Love this country. May God bless you. May he keep you. And may God save the United States of America. <laughs>